Got my glasses back. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, View, and thank you, uh, Chairman Gallagher. Uh, we are now on item six as we continue the Cuyahoga County Committee of the Whole. Um, and uh, our next item of business um, is a discussion um, about the uh, council authority to issue a subpoena and consideration of subpoena issuance to the county sheriff. And we are going to have our legal counsel, uh, Brendan Doyle, uh, come and walk us through what the process is and what the authority of the council is under the charter and take questions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I believe this is your first council meeting, Mr. Doyle. It is. So just expect it to always be this way. <laughs> Very smooth, no fireworks. Uh, council members, um, in order to discuss with you the council's authority for issuing subpoenas, I first need to start with the council's authority under the charter to conduct investigations. And that authority is set forth in section 3.12 of the county charter. And under that section, it states that the council may investigate the financial transactions of any office of county government and the official acts and conduct of any county official relating to any matter upon which council is authorized to act. As part of an investigation, the charter authorizes the council to compel the attendance of witnesses and or the production of documents through the issuance of subpoenas. To authorize the issuance of a subpoena, a resolution must be adopted by a vote of at least eight members of the council. If the council votes to issue a subpoena, the subpoena is signed by the council president and that subpoena is then uh, served by uh, any officer who is authorized under the law to serve the subpoena. If any person served with a subpoena uh, issued by the council should refuse to testify or if that person should refuse to produce the documents that are the subject of that subpoena, then the council may refer the matter by a simple majority vote to the county prosecutor to cause the witness to be punished as for contempt. Uh, that is what's set forth in the charter with regard to the council's authority to uh, conduct investigations and to issue subpoenas, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Doyle. And um, given, obviously, that this is the first time the council has considered uh, action like this, why we do expect to have a thorough discussion, so uh, that is our expectation. Uh, who would like to, would anyone like to go first? Councilman Schron. Mr. Doyle, um, if someone were to, to be subpoenaed and brought forth and they have a reasonable belief that they are under criminal investigation and they have counsel uh, and they are asked a question in their mind and their counsel's advice, uh, reason believes that uh, their answer is, I refuse to answer on the basis that might incriminate me under the Fifth Amendment. Is that an answer? I think uh, it is absolutely that person's right under the Constitution to, to assert that. Uh, however, I think that it is going to be at the discretion of the council as to whether it considers to that to be compliance and whether to then refer it to the county prosecutor. I think that for purposes of that individual who's asserting that right, I, I believe that that is uh, something that they can do under the Constitution. However, for purposes of the council's subpoena, compelling testimony, I would not consider that to be uh, a sufficient answer. Um, in, in this instance, the county sheriff appointed uh, to uh, report to the council as to the operations of the jail or the sheriff's office. So then following that logic that the answer was insufficient uh, and uh, this body then gets a vote of six to refer it uh, and uh, for uh, failure to adhere to the subpoena and uh, then the county prosecutor then takes action on the basis of that. So the next step uh, based on the way you uh, went through that scenario is that uh, assuming that the, Competent jurisdiction says, all right, we're going to put him in jail for a refusal to answer. Is that where you believe that logic will end up going? Uh, no, I would not. I, okay. I think this is, a, this is a civil subpoena. This is not a criminal subpoena. Okay. So I think that there are, assuming that 
there is a court of competent jurisdiction uh, that the court has uh, much more discretion with regard to um, if it were to find uh, somebody in contempt, uh, it would have a lot more options available to it than if it were uh, a criminal uh, subpoena and subject to criminal contempt. I would also um, uh, I would also say that I think that there would still, even before getting to that point, uh, there would have to be um, a hearing held in, in sure. the court and for um, the party being subpoenaed uh, to set forth that good faith basis uh, for why he or she uh, uh, took the Fifth Amendment uh, in that instance. So there would have to be um, a process first before there would be any sort of uh, contempt finding. Uh, but if there were to be a contempt finding, I think uh, that putting someone in jail is, yes, possibly one of the options, um, but it's a very rare uh, possibility under a, a civil, civil contempt finding. Right, but you've raised that that is, is within the scope of if it goes down to the furthest extent where this could go. Uh, if it were to be taken to court, uh, that is something that could occur. Yeah, well, that's, that, that sounds like a yes. <laughs> that's correct. Okay. Um, and can you tell me who is a county official? Because you used the words county official. I wrote them down as soon as you wrote them. Yes. So I think that um, it is a. it can be very broadly interpreted. And I, so I would think that a county official uh, would be um, potentially any county employee, uh, but certainly... Uh, any um, person who has been appointed to any position within county government. Does that include an elected official? Yes. So a county official, is everybody on this body, including the county executive, is, an exe is a county official for purposes of subpoena, contempt, all the way down the line? That's correct. Thank you. All right. Anybody want to go next? Anybody want to go next? Councilwoman Simon. Sure. Um, I'm, thank you, um, Council President. I support, I don't have questions. Are we discussing this? I mean, the question is, is this a tool that was given to us under the county charter to exercise our oversight to the highest level, issuing a subpoena? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, Mr. Boyle. Um, let me then just move into more general discussion because I think that's where we are already. Uh, I know that um, that uh, our legal counsel has had the opportunity to speak with many members of council over the last several days um, about the mechanics of this. Um, this is not the kind of action that I think anybody, um, you know, um, gets up in the morning and wants to do. Uh, my opinion is that... Um, it's a pretty good track record that we've gotten in eight and a half years uh, without ever having to take an action like this or feeling like we even need to discuss it, even though sometimes I think we've felt like we needed to discuss it. Um, but um, the position the council finds itself in, I believe now, is a, is a rare one and a unique one, and not one that should be repeated, uh, uh, not a way of life for this council in this county. But when, they, when the sheriff came before the council uh, last week and not only refused to answer questions that they thought might be inappropriate, um, they refused to answer any questions. Uh, this council is put into a serious corner in terms of its authority. Um, and I don't think that uh, the council can... Um, uh, let this one pass. I think it's important that the council take a stand, and uh, I am uh, for uh, subpoenaing uh, the sheriff uh, and asking these questions uh, that need to be asked in the, in a public meeting. And we have the authority to do that. And I don't think that we should feel uh, any re any 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 second. We shouldn't second guess ourselves about doing our job. We have to protect the integrity of this council. If this is allowed to, if this is allowed to go unanswered, then who who will never who will ever come before us and answer our questions? And on the other hand, if we go forward with this, maybe we'll get a lot more uh, cooperation uh, from everybody involved 
um, given that we will have shown that we have teeth. Um, this authority is not taken lightly, but it was given to us to the charter by the charter for a reason, and I think we have found that point, that the council has found that place and that time when I think we should can seriously consider um, going forward with this subpoena. And I'd like to hear comments from other members if they have them. Councilwoman. Mr. President. Um, through the chair, um, just wanted to say that I personally believe as being an elected official, of District 7, I believe we have, we each have a responsibility to the citizens of this county um, to have questions answered from anyone in the employee of the county, uh, whether they're an official or not an official, because we're all supposed to be on the same wavelength and, and working on behalf of the residents that want and choose to live in Cuyahoga County. And I also felt, um, I, I want to say I respect uh, his position from the way he may have felt, but I also, in, in terms of him doing his job, but whether we're friends at the end of the day or not, we have a job and responsibility up here on this on this podium to do what we were elected to do on, on behalf of the residents. So I felt that my personal feeling um, was that if we let this go, because um, I'm with Councilwoman Simon, the one that pushed for this subpoena, is that we would set a precedent a precedent for this county um, that employees um, can just decide that they don't want to answer. And, and, and I know there's, there's small things and there's, there's big things, but this is a big one because, as Councilman Jones said earlier, these have direct impact on people's lives. So we don't want to set a, I don't want to set a precedence. Can't speak for my colleagues here, but I don't want to set a precedence. And I want people in District 7 and all over this county to know that I care that people, individuals died and that it impacted their families and that we need to do something about this matter. Mr. President and, and my colleagues, I also support the issuance of a subpoena in this case. And, and, and the reason why I do is that we all know that we have had very, very serious problems in, in the county jail. And uh, people's lives and well-being have been, been affected. And uh, it is the responsibility of the council to understand what those problems are and, and to uh, play a constructive role in, in, uh, in assisting the administration to come up with and implement effective and expeditious solutions. I think we have not been able to do that and need to. Uh, while being in support, I also have to say that I don't think uh, uh, issuing the subpoena absolves us of the responsibility to be cautious and judicious as to what kind of questions we ask. Uh, I don't believe it is the council's role to uh, delve extensively into what happened in the past, who said what to whom, and, and who knew what, when, and how we got to the situation that we're in. These, uh, these things are under investigation by by the appropriate legal authorities, and and uh, and there is pending litigation that we do not want to have an adverse impact on, and so uh, I think we have to be uh, responsible and judicious in in that aspect. But nevertheless, we absolutely have to be uh, vigorous, active, and and uh, in in working with the administration to solve the problems as quickly as possible, and we need more information to do that than we've been able to get. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, all I would like to say is that I encourage my colleagues to consider use of this tool to pursue, pursue information wherever and from whoever we 
are led to believe has information that can help us make better decisions. Um, just as the my colleagues ask who we could use the subpoena on, I don't think we should ever be afraid to use this tool to get information that will help us, us do our jobs to the best of our ability. Councilwoman Simon, and again, Councilman Sean has indicated he also would like to speak. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I advocate and have advocated for the use of the subpoena in this case because of the serious nature of what's been going on in the jail, and I agree with my colleagues and especially um, Kali Conwell about it's our duty and responsibility to try to get to the bottom and to stop this from happening. And the only way we can do this as a council, as an elected representative of our district, is to get information. But this is not some decision we're making in a vacuum either. This has been a year's worth of non-answers, um, misstatements of fact, obfuscation of information, hiding, dodging bullets, saying they don't read martial reports when they're on vacation, um, coming before this body, the, and I have to say it was the sheriff who stood before us and said he didn't read the report, um, and that was days after it was issued because he was out of town, and, and so when it comes to this point, it's not as if we just are knee-jerking and saying we need to do this. It's because of this past year of everything that's um, come before us and the result of that act action and non-action is um, where we are today and we don't have a choice as a body to to move forward and and getting answers as best we can and try to s resolve um, this this plague that's been upon us uh, councilman Tron and then I'll I'd like a, another shot at this to thank you mr. chairman um, the subpoena is going to request they come in and and answer questions, uh, and uh, the subpoena is going to request they bring documents should the subpoena be asking for it. I didn't necessarily pick that up from any of the 53 questions as far as documents. Uh, did you? No. Okay. All right. So I didn't. So when the reference is that when you gave us the 30,000 foot was, was the generic authority to do it. Correct. So um, the specifics in regards to the subpoena being discussed is a requirement to ask questions or answer questions. Did you review all 53 of these questions? I have reviewed the questions, yes. All 53 of the questions? Yes. Okay. Of the 53 questions being asked, you being somebody who was involved with the prosecutor's office has probably a good awareness of what would have a criminal tone to the question. Those maybe are straight administrative questions. Did you look at those 53 and say, you know, this really does have a strong criminal tone that counsel is probably stuck between a rock and a hard spot because I'm torn on this the same thing I, I want to enforce what we have the right to do and what we have the obligation to do but I also want to recognize that this body is not as big as our Constitution uh, as, as important as we might think this issue is and so I want to make sure that you, when you review those 53 that you as a good lawyer would not be asking this body to say, ask all 53 of these, because some of these, clearly in my opinion, uh, having practiced criminal law, would be one that no lawyer in the world is going to be able to advise their client to answer a question, some of these questions. Have you looked at those from that standpoint? I looked at it from the standpoint of what questions could an appointed county sheriff answer in a public meeting and what questions would the civil litigators from the county prosecutor's office advise could not be answered in a public meeting? Uh, I did not look at it from a criminal standpoint to the extent that a person who's been subpoenaed has a personal attorney who is advising them on the criminal aspects of things. Um, I did not look at it in that from that respect. So we haven't even reviewed it, knowing that we have nine deaths, that this man was the sheriff, and that there's some likelihood that there'll be conversations someplace along the way, whether how they turn out. Would that be something that you would be capable of reviewing for? Because- I, and, I, and I appreciate your question, and I appreciate where it's coming from. However, I don't know the nature of the investigations, the criminal investigations that are going on. I don't know who, if any, who the criminal prosecutors have talked with or the direction that they are going in in their probe. So I 
don't feel as though I would be in a position to, first of all, look at the questions from that standpoint. And secondly, I think only the person who's been, in this instance, if it's the sheriff and his personal attorney, only only the sheriff's personal attorney could look at it from that perspective, from that criminal perspective, to determine that angle or perspective, that angle of things. I think that for the, from the perspective of this council and from the perspective of the civil litigators, I think that their concern is the civil litigation uh, that is pending. And they do not have any knowledge of the criminal investigation. So uh, I don't feel like I'm in a position to look at those 53 questions or any other questions that are posed by this council to determine what the criminal implications could be for the person to whom those questions are being asked. That would not be something that I think I would be in a position to do. Then you also you wouldn't be in a position to say that there is any bias when the, when the council uh, for the, the sheriff comes in and says, I believe that this is up to the edge. And so how would we have the ability to override that to override, I to, guess to, I... To suggest that question 52 uh, is something that we think that they should have answered their counsel in good belief, and you're, you, you just already said you're not in a position to respond, then you're going to be, you're, you've already discounted yourself to be able to give us advice going forward as to whether or not that question 52 should go forward as to be sanctioned. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm trying my best to... To walk the, uh, I want the administrative questions answered, and I want them nailed. The ones that uh, are putting putting somebody in potential jeopardy because they're uh, at risk of being uh, sent over to the county prosecutor. I want to make sure we also are being fair on that side of the equation. I think the the the, the question of whether that right, that constitutional right, is being asserted on a good faith basis, basis is not something that I or, quite frankly, this council can determine. I think that that is something that a court of competent jurisdiction would have to determine. Okay. Um, on getting to some of the questions that are in here, what was the specific involvement in the process to establish the regional jail system in the county? Sure sounds like an administrative question way above this guy's pay rate. If that is the case, then I I'm just would hope. Question. If that is the case, then I would expect that the county sheriff can answer that question to the council. If it is in fact above his pay grade, then he can answer that question himself. You'd say it's somebody else who made that call, and hopefully they did a financial analysis and how many head count and with the body counts, or as far as how many people you need to have. All that should have been in some work paper someplace. Either those are things that the county sheriff has in in his personal knowledge, or he should be able to say what individual would have that information uh, Good. themselves. I'm hoping he answers those administrative questions and the other ones he doesn't. Uh, we're going to go to um, uh, Councilwoman Baker in a, in a second. I want to just go back to what uh, Councilman Miller uh, uh, said about uh, going forward. If we were to go forward, that the council would have to, and I think it's quite capable of, of doing that, of understanding this is this would not be a typical council meeting uh, and uh, and that uh, to be judicious would certainly be exactly what we would want to be it's what we're capable of being and I don't think we should have a fear of our inability to do that um, and to try to sort of illustrate this if the if we subpoena the sheriff. If the sheriff appears, uh, and we assume his attorney will be here uh, as he was the last time, the sheriff uh, and his, uh, his attorney will still be able to ans answer some questions and be able to, to decline to answer other questions. There's, no, there's nobody going to beat somebody over the head here that they, if they don't answer a question. They can, they can answer it, and they can decide not to answer it. And the consequences of what they decide to not answer have ramifications of which we're not certain of, but we'll all have to face those issues uh, as they unfold because we don't know exactly what each of those uh, questions and answers will be. And I believe that we have the 
the responsibility and the skills to be able to do this in a way that will uh, only bring honor to this body. Councilwoman Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to know if you have any concerns um, regarding some of the technical questions that are on this 53 list, things like questions that could take us to another level of, of leading to other people. So we're, we're going beyond the sheriff. For example, sh jail staffing. It says, were any of your staffing decisions overridden, overturned, or denied by someone? So someone now becomes somebody else besides the sheriff. And questions like, um, did you ever get the sense when Ken Mills was jail administrator that you reported to him or he had the ability to make final decisions over you? If so, where did this impression come from? So we're asking him to leave his responsibility and then tell us about perhaps someone else. And especially under the structure of the sheriff's office where it says, was there ever a time when you were discouraged or believed that if you spoke out against a decision, be it HR, budgetary, or, any other, or anything else, that there would be consequences from the administration. So we're leaving the sheriff and we're going somewhere else. Same with, was there ever a time you felt you couldn't come to a council meeting because of consequences from the administration? Since you became sheriff, were you ever told not to inform council about anything? If so, who told you that? I guess as I'm, is there a concern that you know, we're asking the sheriff about his responsibilities, but then we're also asking him to talk about other others that were in his uh, circles that he may or may not been listening to or accountable to or felt that he was. So if, if I am interpreting your question, your, is your question, does the subpoena restrict the types of questions that can be asked of an individual? I guess I'm asking that if he answers and he chooses to answer and he then goes on to perhaps more uh, than what we thought he would answer and it starts involving other people in detail, uh, is that a good place for us to, given the indictments, you know, investigations, things that are going on around us, is that a good place for us to be? I think that the the council has an oversight role within the county government and i think that the subpoena is compelling testimony and that testimony will lead you wherever it's going to lead you and i can't speak to again as i as i mentioned previously i can't speak to the nature of the criminal probe the criminal investigation but i think from an oversight perspective the questions are going to lead you where they lead you and there's no restrictions on the questions that this body can ask. There can be objections made by individuals to those questions, but there's no restrictions on the questions that this that this body can ask of an individual, and certainly not no restrictions on the questions that this body can ask of an individual that's been subpoenaed by this body. Okay, just wanted that clarification. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go to Councilman Conwell, then back to Councilman Miller. Um, through the chair to Mr. Doyle, um, out of the 53 questions that were, that were given, uh, Councilman Gallagher asked 17 specific that he thought would not have any legal ramifications uh, one way or another, especially since that's how uh, it was uh, presented to us. Did you take a look at those specific 17? And if you did, did you, did you agree? Um, with Councilman Gallagher. I don't remember the exact number of questions that I thought could be answered in a, in a public meeting, but there were a number of questions out of those 53 that I thought could be answered in a public meeting. Uh, yes. Okay, and going forward, can we, um, my memory serves me, is that, and I could be wrong, I thought that the attorney said that they would be willing Mr. Blake said they would be willing to do answer some questions in executive session. That's my recollection as well. Okay, so after this subpoena step, where are we? Um, we will subpoena. We're doing our if, if it gets voted that way. Can we still possibly have an executive session um, 
on the questions, I guess, that are deemed out of the 53 that are suitable. But if you're in executive session, you should be able to answer all 53. So if this council should decide to subpoena the sheriff, then uh, it's my understanding that, yes, the possibility of going to an executive session is something that would be part of the discussion going forward. Yes. Okay. Before the prosecutor would make their determination on what to do? Um, do you mean before any sort of referral to the, well, that, to the county prosecutor? Yeah, right. So yeah. it, it wouldn't be to that to that stage yet in the okay. process. Okay. It would still be at the, pro at the stage of the process where um, the individual has been subpoenaed and this individual is expected to appear before the council to uh, give testimony. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Millen, then Councilman Jones. Mr. President, to, uh, to Mr. Doyle, I'd like to follow up on something that the council president alluded to, which is that he said that the, uh, that is subpoenaed that the sheriff, even in this environment, could answer some questions and decline to answer other questions. The question I have is that in the, in the earlier round, the sheriff declined to answer most of the questions on the grounds of their being related to ongoing civil or criminal litigation. But he did not invoke the Fifth Amendment. And my question is uh, whether he could continue to do that, or, or, or if in the subpoena environment, if, if it's... Uh, if it's not something that he just doesn't know or so, something like that, if he, if he has information but does not want to answer the question, will he have to invoke the Fifth Amendment? If, if there's a question that's asked and he doesn't have an answer to the question, I guess I would distinguish that from... Right, I'm distinguishing that. Right. But other than that situation... So I think in both instances, if it was a situation, well, if the sheriff were asked a question and he didn't have the information or if he didn't want to give information, if that's what your question is asking. I'm asking about a situation where he has information, but he doesn't want to give it. Uh, will he have to invoke the Fifth Amendment or can he say the same thing that he did uh, at the original hearing? I'm not sure that for purposes of how this council would proceed in that situation that it would make any difference whether he would answer whether he would answer the question like he did the last time or whether he would invoke the 5th amendment the council would have to make a determination one way or the other whether that whether it considers that to be compliance with the council's subpoena and to make a determination as to whether it would want to refer that to the county prosecutor at that point well, for uh, as one of eleven, I would not consider any response that 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 just says that he's not going to answer because of ongoing investigations to be compliant. If he says that he's invoking the Fifth Amendment, well, then I'm more than willing to consider that because a person has a right not to say something that might be self-incriminating. Uh, Mr. President, just one other thing. I, I've said it before, but I want to want to say it again, which is that uh, that I strongly believe that we cannot go into executive session and discuss matters that are tangentially related potentially to an ongoing investigation and, uh, and claim that as a proper executive session under discussion of pending litigation. Uh, my belief is that, uh, that if we go into executive session for that purpose, we have to directly be discussing the pending litigation and, and what it is and how we're going to deal with it. And if, if some of these questions come up 
in the context of that discussion, uh, we could then discuss it, but but I don't think we can uh, uh, use that that justification for a general discussion of of the uh, of the problems at the jail and how we're going to deal with them. That that somebody doesn't want to discuss in open session. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Miller and Councilman Jones. Of the fifty-three questions that were presented, we would. They were given because we believed he could answer them. Has has your opinion of that changed? Do you think they can still answer these fifty three questions based on the parameters you have of civil, not criminal, but civil? Can they still answer those same fifty three questions? Well, to to clarify, the the drafting of the fifty three questions occurred before uh, my start date, so I wasn't involved in the drafting of the fifty three questions. But I do believe that the questions. Um, after reviewing them are all questions that that the that the that there could be answers given um, you know and 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 you know whether that is to give information on the question itself or to lead it to somebody else to say that person is the person who could best answer this question I believe that there are answers to those questions that can be given so if we were to subpoena and they come forward, and he comes forward with his lawyer, and uh, he does not answer the questions. Describe the our next actions or the consequences of him not answering. What what are they? So I think um, whether it's the county sheriff in this instance, or any person who has been subpoenaed by the council uh, to um, to testify, if someone should come before the council and refuse to testify then the next step for this council is to determine whether it wants to uh, vote and refer the matter to the county prosecutor for the county prosecutor to uh, pursue a contempt finding against that individual. What does that mean to have a contempt finding against him? So you are um, being found uh, to, it's essentially, it's a sanction. Um, you are being sanctioned for your failure to um, to do that which the subpoena has compelled you to do, whether that's testify or to produce documents. Um, and the sanction can be any number of things. Um, it could be a monetary fine. It could be as extreme as um, being put for a period of time in jail. Um, it could be any number of things. And, and is it determined by the... Uh or the prosecutor makes a, if you're considering dollar amounts in jail time, this is like a prosecutor's recommendation to a judge? It would be in most instances when it comes to a subpoena and a contempt finding, uh, that is determined by a court. Court, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Which court? Which court? Since I have the floor, which court? <laughs> <laughs> which court? I, I think that the, I think that most likely that answer would be the common police court, um, but I think that that would be a determination with regard to how how that would proceed. That would that determination would be made by the county prosecutor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Simon. So there seems to be some confusion about what what this is about and it's getting confusing because we're talking and throwing things out like fifth amendment and what if he doesn't answer and what happens to him he has been employed by this county and has a duty to answer questions if he chooses not to answer a question whether it's 52 53 or 60 or 5 there's a consequence to him not answering when i asked him questions last time whether he was invoking the fifth the answer was no whether he was investigation um, himself, the answer was no. So the questions, uh, Councilman Tron was not here. There was no invocation of any legitimate defense for, his, for him not answering questions, other than some mysterious investigation of which he's not a party. So if there truly was a defense or some legitimate um, reason for him not to answer, this council body would have taken that seriously and, and would be able to consider whether we would force him to answer that particular question for which he, she, he raised this defense. We would have the ability, but what happened 
for those who weren't here, is he didn't answer anything. He answered nothing. And clearly, his failure to answer, there was no legitimate basis for him to do that. So that I want to be clear about that. So if, if he does invoke the fifth, the next round, um, by his personal lawyer, sure. You know, we can make a consideration whether that particular question would be referred to the prosecutor. But if you ask him, was he involved in decision making about the, the regional jail project, and as he refuses to answer that, then sure enough, I'm going to send that over to the prosecutor to file a motion with the court, for the court to, to compel him to answer, because there's no reason for him not to. I mean, he is a resident and an employee of this county and has a duty to be forthcoming period. If he has a legitimate defense, he can assert that, and we can be fair-minded to decide whether that particular answer would, would require us to send it to the prosecutor. The prosecutor files a motion in the common pleas state court, and then it goes into a judicial um, body, a judge, to determine whether or not he has a legitimate basis to, to not answer. So there's due process. In fact, there's due process here, and there'll be due process when if it goes forward. But there's no mystery. There's no s sanction we are asserting against the sheriff that we don't want to do. But he has a duty, and it's our duty to make sure that he can answer questions legitimately. Because as of today, I've not heard any legitimate defense or reason why he's not answering questions. Um, thank you, Councilwoman Simon. I, um, I, I think it's... Uh, Kind of painfully obvious that if the if the sheriff had asked uh, had answered um, some of the questions, um, we might not be at the point we're at here today. Uh, to not answer any questions is really completely in defiance of this council's authority, and I don't think can be tolerated. This is in front of us uh, in the committee of the whole, simply for con for discussion. We are we are not. We do not need to vote this out of the Committee of the Whole, uh, but I want to tell you that uh, considering what I've heard um, and considering discussions that I've had, I believe that there is uh, sufficient support um, for uh, us to uh, have a further uh, discussion about this in the, in the regular council meeting, and so it's be, it will be my intention uh, to, uh, if I have the votes at that time, um, to, um, uh, that is six, to walk the legislation on, to walk this legislation on to the council and for, and for this issue to be resolved this evening. And so if there's no further comments, uh, we are, uh, the Committee of the Whole um, is adjourned and the regular, obviously we'll take up the regular council meeting at five o'clock. Thank you very much.